post since the gag order. So he was, uh, you know, explaining to the judge that this was essentially a mistake and that it had been taken down. Um, you know, he blamed part of this on the large ma machinery of a campaign. So the judge said he would take this under advisement. He did not rule today on what he would do, but he said, I want to make clear that Donald Trump is still responsible for the large machine, even if it is a large machine. So saying that the buck stops with Donald Trump. Uh, so he has not issued a ruling on that. We're waiting still to see if he will do anything more on that today or if he is satisfied by this explanation. But the former president's daughter, Ivanka Trump, has also moved to quash a subpoena for her testimony in this case. She is no longer a defendant in the case after an appeals court threw out the claims against her, saying that they had happened too long ago. Uh, but she is trying to fight the subpoena. Also, we're learning next week, Michael Cohen is expected to take the stand, and he will be facing Donald Trump, who is also expected to appear in court. Boris, Brianna? That will be a big appearance. Kara Scannell, thank you for that. So sources say that two American hostages, this is very big news that we've been following today, a mother and a daughter have been released by Hamas. We'll have the very latest details on this next. The new CNN prime time is where the truth shines. The day's biggest stories, the night's most essential reporting. This is the new CNN prime time, weeknights starting at 7 on CNN. now with breaking news out of the Middle East. Two American hostages have been released by Hamas. They are now in Israel, we've learned. The State Department is expected to give a briefing here in minutes. Well, let's get right to Tel Aviv with the breaking news. CNN's Caitlin Collins helped break this story. So, Caitlin, what are you learning about the two Americans and their release? Yeah, uh, amazing news for the families of Judith and Natalie Renan, who have been desperately waiting on words of their loved ones, and now we have confirmed that they are the two American hostages that have been released by Hamas and are now in Israel, according to the Prime Minister's office here. They are on their way to an Israeli military base in central Israel, and that is where they are going to be meeting their family, who is waiting for them tonight. Now, Judith and Natalie, many people are familiar with their story. We've been talking about it a lot ever since they were abducted by Hamas on October 7th. They're from Illinois, and they were just in Israel visiting. Natalie had just graduated from high school. She was here with, with Judith, her mother. They were celebrating a relative's 85th birthday and also the end uh, of the Jewish holiday, Simchat Torah. They were staying at a kibbutz just about an hour away from Gaza as this attack unfolded. And both of them were kidnapped into Gaza. People had been waiting on words of their condition. And now we've learned that they are being released. And of course, a lot of people are going to be asking why these two hostages? Why did Hamas decide to release them? Well, according to a statement that we've gotten from Hamas, they say this is on humanitarian grounds. We are told that the mother, Judith, is not in good health. And though we don't have a lot of details, I want to stress about her condition. We're still trying to report those out. But obviously, this is incredibly significant news. It's going to be bittersweet, though, for a lot of these families, many of them that we saw earlier today here in Tel Aviv where they were doing um, a Shabbat dinner, which, of course, every everyone in the Jewish faith does on Friday. It's a time for family and friends to get together. And a lot of these people who've had their relatives, their family, their friends, their loved ones abducted, Shabbat dinner was the last time they saw some of them. And so we were at this ceremony earlier for the families and the relatives of those who have been abducted, where they had set this table, a very long table that had over 200 empty chairs for those who are celebrating Shabbat dinner tonight without their loved ones. And of course, that was something that happened just hours before we heard this news that was confirmed that they have been released. And what we do know about the release is that it was something that was brokered by Qatar as they had been having these discussions with Hamas about getting these hostages released. There are still a lot of other questions, though, uh, Boris and Brianna, about what this is going to look like and who is going um, to potentially be coming next, whether or not Hamas is planning to use this in other ways for their release. But it is significant news on that front, of course. And Caitlin, is there a sense that this is just a, a one-off? Or could it be the start of more negotiation, more releases, possibly? That's the big question here, because, of course, Hamas labeled a terrorist organization by the United States, certainly not benevolent by any means. That is going to be the big question of how they're trying to use this, because we know in the past Hamas has captured, they captured an Israeli military officer. They held him for years, and in the end, he was released in exchange for uh, over a 1,000 
Palestinian prisoners. And so that was something that people were talking about immediately when they realized the depth of how many people Hamas had taken into custody, how many hostages that they had captured, was how that was going to release and whether or not they'd be willing to release any hostages at all. I mean, this is the first time that we have actually heard this. And so that is a big question going forward, whether or not it's going to mean the release of others. Hamas has made a lot of claims about this. We can't really trust many of them. Um, so I do want to just make sure that we are waiting to see what it is that Israeli officials are saying. We're waiting to hear from the White House on this, actually. We have not heard from them yet. They were waiting. We were told by sources until these two hostages were safely out. And so we are waiting on that. And as we continue to see what the White House is going to say and for the State Department briefing, I want to go to CNN's Nick Robertson, who is in Sterot, Israel, and has been monitoring a lot of the activity there on the ground. Nick, what have you been seeing in the last few hours? Yeah, I think it was quite noticeable, uh, Caitlin, right as the news was beginning to break about a mother and daughter being released. Uh, that was when Hamas kind of broke the silence, or one of the groups in, in, in Gaza broke the silence of the day. It had been so calm here up until then, and they fired out a huge salvo of rockets. Uh, the interceptor missiles went off, and literally uh, at the top of this hour again, they did exactly the same. I think we have the video. You can see it there. A huge salvo of rockets coming coming out of Gaza. The Iron Dome intercepts as those missiles were headed north into Israel. The intercepts were, were plucking them out of the sky, if you will, knocking them knocking them down. Um, I think, it, it, you know, if Hamas is trying to send more than one message today about why it's released these hostages, it is also sending a message that it clearly intends to continue its military campaign with these salvo of rockets. Again, I say it was noticeable earlier today that it was quiet. It was quiet. There weren't any Israeli uh, missiles going into Gaza or artillery, and it created an impression, created, I would say, an impression, we can't say for sure, that there were talks or discussions or something going on in the background, because this was, until that moment, a far quieter time. There are a lot of drones in the sky at the moment, and Hamas has now created the perception from where we stand that while Israel didn't have drones in the air and wasn't putting artillery uh, and uh, missile strikes into Gaza, they were using the opportunity, it appears, to line up salvo after salvo after salvo of rocket fire out. Our location here had a salvo of rockets shortly after the announcement about the hostage release, uh, a, a five sequence salvo of, of rockets that's more, I think, than we've seen in even a couple of days before, and that came all within the space of a little over an hour. Wow. So it does look as if Hamas used that quieter period to position rockets for firing. Yeah, that's really interesting, Nick, because it's also been quiet here in Tel Aviv this evening, and typically on a daily basis we've had one or two rockets fired by Hamas at, toward Tel Aviv. We've seen the Iron Dome intercepting those. Nick Robertson on the ground in Sterot will continue to check in with you. Of course, humanitarian aid is a big part of this conversation that we've having been having today and when it is going to cross over that crossing between uh, Egypt and Gaza, the Rafa crossing, the only way that that aid can get across. CNN's Clarissa Ward is in Cairo. I'm going to go to Clarissa right now. Clarissa, uh, this is a big question of when this is going to happen. There were rumors that it was going to happen early Friday morning. That didn't happen. What are we hearing and what have you been seeing on the ground in Cairo today? So, Caitlin, we actually went to the Rafa border crossing with the U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres. I think originally he hoped that maybe he was going to be going there to announce a diplomatic win, that somehow some of that aid would start to get in. We saw hundreds of trucks that have been lined up for many days now. Um, no sense at the moment, though, as to when they will be able to get into Gaza, where they're so desperately needed. President Biden has said he's going to hoping that it will happen in the next 24 to 48 hours. But, Caitlin, there are a couple of key sticking points here. The major issue is the issue of Israel's demand for verification. They want to make sure that they have a way of trusting that there is nothing in those trucks other than aid. There is no weaponry or anything like that. So they then have to set that up somehow. Where would it happen? Who would have eyes on it? And how can that be done in an expedited manner so that the aid gets in there, gets in there in a timely way? The second piece of the puzzle is that the UN is not happy with this just being 20 trucks of aid. 
to give you some perspective, before this outburst of violence started, it was roughly 455 trucks of aid a day that would go into Gaza. So 20 trucks of aid after two weeks of no aid is clearly just a drop in the ocean. And what the UN said that they're worried about, Caitlin, is that if they just go in with 20 trucks and no promise of follow-up and no guarantee of a continuous humanitarian corridor, they're worried that the trucks are going to get mobbed, that their workers are going to get mobbed, and that it could actually become a dangerous situation. There had also been concern about the fact that there was damage on the Palestinian side of the border, on the Gazan side of the border, from airstrikes and strikes in the area. And the Egyptians said that they have largely paved over those areas and fixed them. But what was super interesting, Caitlin, was that when we arrived at the border with the UN Secretary General, he had hoped to also talk to some of the volunteers and the truck drivers who've been camped out there for days. Instead, he walked into a main a, a protest of, I would say, two or three hundred people, very angry people, a lot of anger, obviously, at Israel in the U.S., but also a lot of anger at the international community for being hamstrung, for doing, uh, for not being able to put a stop to the violence and a start to the aid, and also, Caitlin, a huge amount of anger at the Western media. And one woman started shouting at me, so we went over to her and invited her to talk to us. Take a listen to what she had to say. We are here to speak the truth because Western laws, I'm not going to generalize, but a lot of Western channels have been aiding in the dehumanization of Arabs. You say a hundred, when I say the word Muhammad, how does that make you feel? You immediately flinch because that's what's been happening. So now when a thousand plus Palestinian babies die, you don't feel the same. You don't feel the same as when I tell you one of your own has died. But these are our own. And it is unfair in Egypt. Secretary General Caitlin was trying to deliver his remarks as this protest was going on. It got chaotic and animated enough that he actually had to be whisked away uh, in a car. We were also put back on the buses and escorted out. But gives you a feel of the anger, of the desperation, and meanwhile, the people in Gaza suffering and waiting for that desperately needed aid. Yeah, and every minute we just continue to see that. Clarissa Ward, great reporting. We'll check back in with you in Cairo. I want to toss it over now to my colleague Anderson Cooper, also here in Tel Aviv. Yeah, Caitlin, thanks very much. Demonstrations in support of Palestinians have drawn tens of thousands of people across the Middle East, as you've been seeing in North Africa. Here's a look at some of the protests in Yemen, in Egypt, in Turkey, in Jordan, to name just a few. The crowd spanned for blocks in some cases. Sinas Nada Bashir is in Amman, Jordan, and spoke to people uh, there about uh, what is happening here. Well, for yet another night, hundreds of people have gathered here in downtown Amman near the Israeli embassy to protest in solidarity with the Palestinian people, but also to express their outrage and condemnation of Israel's continued airstrikes on the Gaza Strip. But this isn't the only protest that we've seen here today in Amman. This follows an enormous march which took place earlier today. Thousands of people participating in that. Take a look. In downtown Amman, worshippers gather for Friday prayers. But it's not just the call to prayer that has drawn these crowds today. But a call to action and solidarity with the Palestinian people. This protest is a pledge they chant. But the people of Jordan will not leave Gaza alone. Thousands of men, women and children, entire families, draped in the traditional Palestinian scarf, a symbol for many of Palestinian resistance. Well, you can hear how loud the crowds are here. Forget another day in Amman. Thousands of people have taken to the streets, protesting against Israel's continued aerial bombardment of the Gaza Strip, protesting in solidarity with the Palestinian people. We are doing this for our families who are dying in Gaza because we are unable to do anything. So the least we can do is stand here in solidarity with them, to support them so that they know that we are with them, with our hearts and everything. 
Because there is palpable outrage here in Jordan over Israel's ongoing bombardment of the siege Gaza Strip and deep-seated anger directed towards both Israel and Israel's Western allies. Many here even calling on the Jordanian government to close down the U.S. and Israeli embassies in Amman. For days now, protests have taken place not only across Jordan, but also across the wider region. In Cairo, where the state has long clamped down on mass demonstrations, hundreds gathered in Tahrir Square. We need justice! We need justice! Hours earlier, at the Rafah border crossing between Egypt and Gaza, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres was forced to cut his visit short after protests erupted there. Gaza has faced relentless Israeli airstrikes for almost two weeks now. And protests across the Arab world and the wider region are at a boiling point. Iraq, Tunisia, Yemen and Turkey and even further afield. And with Gaza on the brink of a humanitarian catastrophe, this protest movement is only growing stronger. Uh, look, we've been speaking to protesters every night. They have told us that they will continue taking to the streets so long as Israel's bombardment of Gaza continues, so long as the siege on Gaza is in place, so long as the blockade is in place. This is a deeply personal issue for many people here in Jordan, for many people across the Middle East. Not a Bashir standing by for mm. an update now from the State Department. We're expecting that any moment on the two American hostages who have been released by uh, Hamas. We're going to bring that to you when it happens. We'll be right back. strikes continue and aid agencies are warning that humanitarian supplies are desperately needed. The most tragic victims in all of this, the children. According to the Palestinian Ministry of Health, the death toll in Gaza has climbed to 4,127. And do you know that 1,661 of them are children? CNN Jamana Karadesh reports on how the war is impacting children who make up nearly half of Gaza's population. And I want to warn you, what you're about to see is graphic and disturbing. <laughs> Why, why have you gone, my son, he wails. He wanted to be a pilot. You're only sleeping, he says, kissing his boy's lifeless body. Every day of this war has brought pain, pain no parent wants to ever live through. Every 15 minutes in Gaza, a child is killed, a group say. More than 1,500 children killed so far in a war that's only just beginning. A war they didn't choose, one for which they are paying the heaviest price. Those who live haunted by what they've survived, the lucky ones still have parents to hold their hands. Ten-year-old Abdurrahman still doesn't know. The strike that left him injured took away his mom, dad, and three sisters. His aunt, the only one left to try and comfort him. He wakes up, he cries, they give him painkillers, and he goes back to sleep, she says. I'm worried about him, the shock when he wakes up and finds out that his mother and father are gone, his aunt says. He's the youngest, he was so attached to his parents. He used to play football with his dad, he would go with him everywhere. Families here say they all heeded the Israeli military's warning and moved south thinking it would be safe, but it wasn't. Malik's injured in the hips and legs. She lost her mother and siblings in an airstrike. A girl in the third grade. What did she do, her aunt asks. Did she shoot Israeli? She didn't. We're peaceful people in our homes, she says. We didn't launch any rockets or shoot. We didn't do anything. Nine-year-old Mahmoud was out playing when his family home was hit. 
He's in hospital with head and leg injuries. We were playing in the garden and suddenly a missile landed on us, he says. Trees fell on me. My mother, my father, my brother and grandfather are injured. My uncle brought me unconscious to the hospital. Most of the injured in Gaza, doctors say, are children and women. With no power, no water and medical supplies running out, the health care they need is on the verge of collapse. Around half of Gaza's population are children. Most have only ever known life under a blockade and war. Now in this kill box, no place safe from Israel's relentless bombardment. Desperate for any promise of safety, many have flooded as Shifa hospital grounds. The constant buzz of military drones overhead has become part of existence in Gaza. Some find a little escape from this living nightmare no child should ever endure. Though Jane and Julia say their neighborhood was flattened by airstrikes. We've been living in so much fear, panic, and anxiety, she says. Whenever I hear airstrikes, I don't know what to do. I hug my mom. Seven-year-old Julia says she holds her mom, too, and hides. They're now living under the stairs. I get upset when I see injured here in the hospital, Julia says. When I grow up, I want to become a doctor so I can treat them so they can get better. It's a war on Hamas, they say, but it is the youngest who bear the brunt. Ensnared in violence they can't control, trapped in this race against death. Jemana Kanachi, CNN, London. These are children. Children. Just human beings. And what, what are they to do? It really breaks my heart. It breaks all of our hearts to see how these children are suffering. The little girl with the glasses talking about what she wants to be when she grows up. And thinking about what is happening on a daily basis as families in Gaza and families in Israel being torn apart by this war, losing their loved ones, losing their lives, some and others taken hostage, all wondering what the future will be like. In Tel Aviv, the moving site of a Shabbat dinner table with 200 empty chairs, more for more than the 200 hostages who have been held and are being held by Hamas in Gaza. Mothers and fathers, grandparents, uncles, aunts, sons, daughters, human beings. It's a sign of unity seen around the globe. Shabbat tables for hostages all also set up in the Jewish quarter of Rome and Australia's Bondi Beach. You know, so many of us are watching what is happening with the world right now, and it's impossible to feel like we're anything at times but helpless. But up next, we'll tell you how you can help, as we're all bearing witness. Tom Manuaj on Capitol Hill, and this is CNN. Welcome everyone, I'm Michael Holmes with the latest on the Israel-Hamas war. An American woman and her teenage daughter are undergoing medical evaluations in Israel after they were released by Hamas on Friday. Natalie Ranan and her mother Judith were visiting family at a kibbutz close to Gaza when they were taken hostage by Hamas two weeks ago. Hamas is believed to have about 200 hostages. Back home in Illinois, Natalie's father spoke about reuniting with her. I've been waiting for this moment for a long time, for two weeks. I haven't been sleeping for two weeks. Tonight I'm going to sleep good. I spoke with my daughter earlier today. She sounds very good. She looks very good. She was very happy. And she's waiting to come home. I'm going to hug her and kiss her. And uh, it's going to be the best day of my life. We get more now from CNN's Whitney Wilde. The walk to freedom in a snapshot. 59-year-old Judith Renan and her 17-year-old daughter Natalie are finally safe after two weeks as Hamas hostages. They're headed home after many prayers and tears. A community's fear now replaced by joy. Our prayers have been heard for Judith and Natalie, and we are so 
overjoyed. Judith and Natalie traveled to Israel from Evanston, Illinois, and have been missing since the Hamas attacks on October 7th. They were visiting a kibbutz in Israel for Judith's mother's 85th birthday. Judith's sister told CNN she had no idea if they'd ever return. I'm very worried about my sister and my niece. My niece is, um, she's not even 18. She's supposed to be uh, celebrating her birthday on the 24th of this month. We know that young women are being raped and injured and Judith is, is She's not very, very healthy. She says Hamas kidnapped 11 other family members from another kibbutz, and they are still missing, though CNN cannot independently verify that information. As you can imagine, we are devastated, and we are having quite a hard time. Natalie's brother told CNN he's looking forward to hugging his younger sister again and helping however he can as she recovers from the trauma. At least from my father, Natalie, uh, is doing well, is composed. We are ready to start this incredible journey of, of healing and, and trauma relief for her. Both Judith and Natalie are artists, kind, giving, generous souls. The office of the Israeli Prime Minister says the Israel Defense Forces met Judith and Natalie at the Gaza border Friday, along with the International Committee of the Red Cross, transferring them to a military base in the center of Israel to meet family members. As one family readies to embrace their loved ones, the families and friends of hundreds more are left to wait and wonder. They've gone through the most evil period of their life and by people that inflicted just terror and horror to them and to so many others. And our job is to be there for them. According to the White House, President Biden spoke with both Judith and Natalie Friday by phone. U.S. officials are racing to try to bring home the 10 other Americans still in Hamas hands. Whitney Wild, CNN, Evanston, Illinois. And CNN's Katie Bolgrave joins me now live from London with more on this uh, development. Uh, so tell us, I know there's not a lot, but tell us what more we do know about how the hostage release came about and what, if anything, Hamas might get in return. Morning, Michael. Well, yes, clearly this is a diplomatic success, um, certainly in terms for the U.S. Now, Israel is saying that this has come about because of military pressure that is on Hamas at the moment. That's according to an official from the Prime Minister's office that spoke with CNN yesterday. Of course, this is not something that Hamas would agree with. They have said that they released these two on humanitarian grounds, particularly because the mother, Judith, has been in ill health. Again, something that the Israeli side then disputes, saying there is nothing in humanitarianism in Hamas, calling Hamas monsters. Again, this back and forth is what we've come to see a lot of in this war, but for the civilians, for the hostages as well, this is a sign of hope that things might change. And certainly, the Biden administration have been very, very relieved to hear this. Have a listen to what Secretary of State Antony Blinken had to say about it. To welcome the release, we share in the relief that their families, friends, and loved ones are feeling. But there are still 10 additional Americans who remain unaccounted for uh, in this conflict. We know that some of them are being held hostage by Hamas, along with an estimated 200 other hostages uh, held in Gaza. Now, obviously, those other 200 are going to be the focus now, particularly the Americans you mentioned for the Biden administration, but all of them are of grave concern. And really, this success story may be a sign of hope, but there are many, many still in danger yet. Michael. And, and to that point, Katie, is there, is there any sense that we're getting that other releases could be in the works in the near term? Well, you'd like to hope so, and certainly the source that spoke to CNN yesterday said that that is the hope now, that this has gone ahead with success. The U.S. say they were involved uh, very much so in making this happen. They said Qatar also had a key role in mediating. The hope is that potentially the same process could happen again, and we understand that Hamas have said they are talking with what they term friendly countries that involve Egypt and also Qatar about the possibility of releasing other foreign nationals. But it remains to be seen, and clearly we are still witnessing a dire humanitarian crisis on the ground in Gaza for all civilians in Gaza, let alone the hostages as well that are being kept there. And so the situation is clearly very concerning, and unfortunately, as you mentioned, information is scarce. We've not been able to confirm a lot of it 
and the various administrations that are involved in negotiating are either not sharing details for the security of the negotiations or don't have these details themselves. And as a result, some of the families are left seeing horrendous videos online that they may or may not be able to identify some of their relatives in. And really, some of the relatives, this is all the information they're getting. So a really difficult time for a lot of the families. And clearly, there is some good news amongst this, but a lot still remains to be seen. Yeah, uh, great uh, reporting. Thank you, Katie. Katie Polgrove there in London. Now, the IDF says it is preparing for the next stages of the war against Hamas. Let's have a look now. This is uh, tanks lined up near the border with Gaza, where the prospect of a ground incursion still looms. In a news conference, the IDF spokesperson said the current priority, though, is the return of all those hostages. In Gaza itself, as you see there, the Al-Quds Hospital, it says that Israel has demanded the immediate evacuation of the building ahead of an airstrike, perhaps at some point overnight. The World Health Organization says such a demand would be impossible to carry out, given the hospital currently houses around 12,000 displaced people, plus hundreds of patients. The IDF explained why it could be targeted. This is another example of eating right into Hamas's playbook. If we've asked people to evacuate a hospital, and I can't verify this specific case, it's because Hamas are using those hospital grounds or near those grounds to launch rockets. And again, I think any normal person anywhere in the world and in America, if they wanted to carry out a war, why would they do it from a hospital knowing that the IDF is going to respond? Our goal is to try to move civilians out of the way, which if we did call that would be the, what we meant to do, Hamas's goal is to bait us into killing civilians. They went either way. They kill Israeli civilians, they take it as a win. They bait us to killing their own civilians, they take it as a win. That's why they have to be destroyed and, and completely their capability taken out. As Israel prepares for the potential ground incursion into Gaza, the U.S. and its allies are urging the country to be strategic and have clear aims with its goals. U.S. and Western officials have told CNN there should be a particular emphasis on avoiding civilian casualties or any more civilian casualties. From efforts on the ground to an assault from the skies now, Israel's Iron Dome has intercepted another rocket attack from Gaza a few hours ago. The rockets appear to have been aimed towards the center of Israel. Nick Robertson is in Sorok with more on what happened around the time two hostages were freed by Hamas. Just as that news was coming out that uh, Natalie and her mother, Judith, were being released, Hamas, or one of the other groups inside Gaza, launched a massive salvo of rockets right at that time uh, headed towards central Israel. The Iron Dome intercepted them. Um, the, within an hour, they'd done it again, fired multiple rockets towards the center of Israel. They were intercepted again. And in that intervening hour, they fired five salvos into this area in Starot. That is way more than they fired in, in an hour period uh, that we've seen over the past uh, week or so. Now, the Israeli city of Ashkelon is believed to be the most heavily bombarded in the Jewish state. It's south of Tel Aviv, but just north of Gaza. And as we hear from Jeremy Diamond now, living your life under rocket fire can leave your nerves raw, even when running mundane errors. This is life in Ashkelon. The most fired upon city in Israel since Hamas launched its first rockets 12 days ago. Here, fear still grips some. Others carry on, ignoring the sirens' wails. When we're outside, we're very careful. And when we're inside, God is protecting us. Every missile has an address. We don't need to be afraid. In a city where 90% of businesses have closed, this supermarket is a lifeline. There's a lot of businesses that are closed. They're closed. But the supermarket the market is, is working because the people have to eat. They have to drink. You come, what, once a week? or Once a week, enough. And I'm very afraid. If they send now rockets, I must lie on the, on the road and to put my, uh, uh, my hands on my... Uh, 
getting to a bomb shelter isn't an option for everyone here, prompting the city to help evacuate thousands. We still have around 35,000 people that actually live without shelters. So each and every rocket, it means a, a direct risk for them. So we are trying to find solution for them. More than 1,200 rockets have targeted Ashkelon. And while most are intercepted by the Iron Dome, about 200 have made direct hits, displacing families from their homes, causing casualties, and shuttering businesses like this bakery. When we got here, everything was in pieces. The door was out of place. There was a smell of gunpowder. A lot of nails and shrapnel were spread out. Everything was destroyed. We are starting to put things right. In the basement of an unassuming building, Ashkelon's CEO takes us into the city's emergency operations center, where officials try and shorten response times, tracking incoming rockets headed for the city. Rescue teams, police, ambulance, and everything is going from here. So before the rocket even lands, we you know, can see where it would land. We, we, yes, we, we have some estimation where it's going to land. Until then, the first responders wait <laughs> and pray. Jeremy Diamond, CNN, Ashkelon. As of now, people in Gaza waiting for shipments of critical supplies are still waiting. But U.S. President Joe Biden says they should get some relief this weekend. He says trucks carrying much-needed humanitarian aid should be able to get through the rougher border crossing soon. They were supposed to head into Gaza from Egypt Friday as part of a delicate deal. But Mr. Biden said the trucks were delayed because the highway had to be repaved after Israeli shelling there. CNN teams on the ground say repair vehicles have entered Gaza from Egypt. Hopefully fix that side of it. Those delays, though, only adding to the anger CNN Chief International Correspondent Clarissa Ward was at the Rafa border crossing as pro-Palestinian protests erupted. For days they have been waiting. More than 200 trucks full of aid desperately needed in Gaza, but stuck on the Egyptian side of the Rafa border crossing. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres hoped to be here for a much needed diplomatic win. As quickly as possible. Instead, he found himself in the midst of a protest, his remarks drowned out by the crowd. People are chanting over and over again, with our blood, with our souls, we will defend Palestine. There's a huge amount of anger, a huge amount of emotion, much of it directed at the West. We need justice! We need justice! And much also at Western media people here feel have favored Israeli voices over Palestinians. Where is your humanity? A protester starts shouting at me. We invite her to do an interview with us. Okay, Mark, when a thousand plus Palestinian babies die, you don't feel the same. You don't feel the same as when I tell you one of your own has died. But these are our own. And it is unfair, and Egypt will stand with Palestine. All but the Islamists are talking for Israel. If the United Nations is standing for Israel, all these international institutions are standing for Israel. Who's there for the Palestinians? And don't call it a war. The jargon is even more infuriating. It's not a war. They're not on equal footing. It is not a war. For many, it is deeply personal. A Palestinian man holds up his ID. I can't contact you with can't my cover family your there. Families on the other side. Yeah, I have seven sisters and my father, my mother, grandmother, uncles, all my family is there. I can't contact with them. I don't know. Are they okay? You I don't know if they are okay or not. As Egyptian soldiers stand by, the demonstrators get more animated. Protests are normally illegal here, but today the Egyptian president called on people to take to the streets. Uh, this is rapidly becoming a very chaotic scene now. They're trying to get the Secretary General out of here. We are ordered back onto the buses, escorted out through the crowd back to Alicia Airport, where piles of aid sit by the runway 
so close to where they need to be, but held back, the UN says, by complications over how to monitor the trucks that enter Gaza and how to establish a continuous humanitarian corridor. When you saw the anger of those protesters, most of it leveled at Israel and the U.S., but also at the international community for failing to stop the situation. What's your response? I think what's important to say is that we are doing everything we can, uh, engaging with all the parties to make sure that sooner rather than later, uh, we are able to have not only a first convoy, but continued aid to the population in Gaza. Uh, I think it should be as quickly as possible and uh, 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 with as many uh, as possible trucks to cross uh, in the first few days. But that is little comfort to the people of Gaza, for whom every day, every hour is vital. Clarissa Ward, CNN, Rafa, Egypt. Do stay with us when we come back. <laughs> demonstrations in the Middle East where on the ground as people protest Israel's strikes on Gaza and the Palestinian civilians caught in the middle. And the cries of support for the Palestinians caught in the crossfire is reaching fever pitch. CNN's Nada Bashir has more from Amman, Jordan. If you want to caution our viewers, some of the video might be disturbing. In downtown Amman, worshippers gather for Friday prayers. But it's not just the call to prayer that has drawn these crowds today. But a call to action and solidarity to the Palestinian people. This protest is a pledge for a chance that the people of Jordan will not leave Gaza alone. Thousands of men, women and children, entire families, draped in the traditional Palestinian scarf, a symbol for many of Palestinian resistance. Well, you can hear how loud the crowds are here. For yet another day in Amman, thousands of people have taken to the streets, protesting against Israel's continued aerial bombardment of the Gaza Strip, protesting in solidarity with the Palestinian people. We are doing this for our families who are dying in Gaza because we are unable to do anything. So the least we can do is stand here in solidarity with them, to support them so that they know that we are with them, with our hearts and everything. There is palpable outrage here in Jordan over Israel's ongoing bombardment of the siege Gaza Strip and deep-seated anger directed towards both Israel and Israel's Western allies. Many here even calling on the Jordanian government to close down the U.S. and Israeli embassy in Amman. For days now, protests have taken place not only across Jordan, but also across the wider region. In Cairo, where the state has long clamped down on mass demonstrations, hundreds gathered in Tahrir Square. Hours earlier, the Rafah border crossing between Egypt and Gaza, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres was forced to cut his visit short after protests erupted there. <laughs> Gaza has faced relentless Israeli airstrikes for almost two weeks now. And protests across the Arab world and the wider region are at a boiling point. Iraq, Tunisia, Yemen and Turkey, and even further afield. And with Gaza on the brink of a humanitarian catastrophe, this protest movement is only growing stronger. Nada Bashir, CNN, in Amman, Jordan. Still to come on the program, US President Joe Biden speaks with the two American hostages freed by Hamas. Their release is boosting hopes more might soon be set free. We'll be right back. Sunni attack 14 days ago. Journalists were not able to go inside the kibbutz for security reasons until now. CNN's Anderson Cooper went there. Signs of the attack are still all around. That's why 
says this morning that some of the video is tough to watch. Near Oz was one of the first Kibbutzim attacked on October 7th by Hamas gunmen. Security cameras recorded some of them entering armed with automatic weapons and RPGs. When we visited Near Oz this week, the carnage was clear. No family, no home here was untouched by terror. People's possessions are strewn all around, left behind by men who looted and killed for more than seven hours. The silence now sounds sickening. A breeze blows through broken windows. Flies buzz in the debris. The residents who survived are gone. Only some cats have returned. Every home, it seems, has been defiled. Family photos remain on the fridge. The people who lived here hid in their safe room. Lucky for them, the door held strong. You can tell gunmen tried to pry this door open. This handle has nearly been pulled off from, from tugging it. They weren't able, the, the lock held. It looks like they tried to pry open the door as well. You can fit your hand through here. They could just maybe look in, but they couldn't actually break through this door. Around back, we checked the window of the safe room. Inside, the bed and sheets are soaked with blood. One member of the family who hid here was wounded, but he and they survived. But according to the IDF, about a quarter of the 400 people who lived in near Oz are dead or missing. In another house in this kibbutz, a gunman broke in and murdered a woman named Braca Levinson. They not only killed her, they got access to her Facebook account and they live streamed an image of her lying in a pool of blood on the ground so that her friends and family could see. This is Braca Levinson. She was 74 years old. Her neighbors, Adina and David Moshi, were also in their 70s. They'd lived in near Oz for more than 50 years. We found their home completely torched. Dishes were still in the dishwasher. They hid in their safe room when the gunman came. Her granddaughter, Anat, says Adina messaged her family they were okay. My grandmother was a very, very strong. She didn't want us to be panicked um later on worried about you in that moment. yeah she's this kind of woman she always take care of us but inside the safe room there was reason to panic a pool of dried blood evidence of what happened david moshi was shot and killed here holding onto the door handle to prevent the gunman from getting in he was a hero and he was shot um so there are three uh, gunshots on the door that succeeded to break through the door. Their attackers dragged Adina Moshi out through the safe room window. She later appeared in this video posted online sandwiched between gunmen on a motorbike in Gaza. Some of the missing have been found. The bodies of 80-year-old Carmela Dan and her 13-year-old granddaughter Noya were identified this week. Her former son-in-law, Afer Calderon, is still missing as are two of his children, Sahar and Erez. This video shows Erez being dragged away by gunmen, one of whom appears to have blood on his hand. We geolocated where the video was shot. This is the last known location of Erez Calderon. He was 12 years old. He was kidnapped by Hamas gunmen, and he was videotaped as they were dr dragging him away in this direction. This is the fence to the, the kibbutz, and Gaza is only about a mile and a half away. You can see uh, an explosion that's just uh, taken place in Gaza off in the distance. So the gunman didn't have far to take him in order to get him back uh, into Gaza. There's video of Shiri Baba being kidnapped as well, clutching her two children, Ariel and Kafar. Her husband is missing too. We talked to her cousin last week. I want my family back. <laughs> I want my family back. I try to be so tight and, and speak clearly, but I'm, I'm devastated. All of the families of Near Oz are devastated. David Moshi was buried there this week. His granddaughter, Anat, wanted us to see a video that was played at his funeral. It's from a celebration at the kibbutz earlier this year. Mm -hmm. That's 
David singing. He's then joined by other members of the kibbutz. He's singing the first sentence. This is the, what the song means. Um, the time will fix all that breaks. That's the message, and you should, you're allowed to be free, and you're allowed to be sad. But tomorrow we can rebuild and recover. Anderson Cooper, CNN, near Oz. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with much more news. Welcome back. I'm Linda Kincaid. More than 4,100 people have now been killed in Israeli airstrikes on Gaza. That's according to the Palestinian Health Ministry. And that is after the Hamas terror attacks in Israel that killed at least 1,400 people. Well, now a new warning from the United Nations, which says more than half a million people taking refuge in UN shelters in Gaza are under increasingly dire conditions. Well, for more on the humanitarian crisis people are facing, I want to welcome Sari Bashir, the program director at Human Rights Watch. Uh, Sari joins us from the West Bank. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. So you've taught international humanitarian law at Yale Law School. You've led an Israel human rights group promoting freedom of movement for the Palestinians in Gaza. And now you're leading research for Human Rights Watch. How would you describe what's happening in Gaza right now? What's happening in Gaza right now is unprecedented. All of this is unprecedented. The Hamas-led attacks on Israeli civilians on October 7th were the worst civilian massacre in Israeli history. And the Israeli response uh, in terms of airstrikes and deliberately depriving people in Gaza of vital supplies like food, water, fuel, and electricity are also unprecedented. Um, for the last week and a half, um, no supplies have entered Gaza. The Israeli military turned off the water and electricity, which they ordinarily supply to Gaza. Um, there are 1.4 million people who are displaced. People don't have enough water to drink. Um, the sewage is running in the streets because there's no electricity or fuel to pump to pump to power the treatment, uh, the, the pumping stations, and people are also running out of food. It's never been this bad. Uh, so the U.S. president has promised 100 million dollars in humanitarian assistance to Gaza and the West Bank, but just a few days ago, the U.S. vetoed uh, a United Nations Security Council resolution that would have called for a humanitarian pause in the conflict to let aid in. What do you make of that? So first of all, the US president came here and supposedly brokered a deal for humanitarian access that is painfully, painfully under ambitious. Um, uh, president Biden's big accomplishment was getting the Israeli government in theory to allow 20 trucks of goods to enter via the Egyptian crossing. That hasn't happened yet. But the United States can ask of Israel three very simple things. Turn back the water, turn it on. Turn back the electricity, turn it on. There's no security risk to doing that. It can be done immediately. And allow access through the Israeli crossings with Gaza for the hundred, the minimum of 100 trucks per day that humanitarian workers say are necessary. In every previous conflict, the Israeli government has found ways to open the crossings with Gaza and allow humanitarian supplies in. What's different about this particular escalation is that the Israeli government has openly said it is going to deprive civilians in Gaza of vital necessities like food and water in, in retaliation for the actions of fighters. Gaza is about the size of the city of Philadelphia. There's 2.2 million people, nearly half of whom are children. That's collective punishment. When the Israeli military denies vital supplies to children to punish them for the acts of adult fighters, it's collective punishment and it's a war crime. And we are hearing that this hour, uh, that border crossing uh, from Gaza and Egypt, the Rafa crossing will open to allow some of those aid trucks to go in. But you're saying this, this kind of, we don't, we don't know how long that, that border crossing will be open if in, indeed it does open. You're saying that these aid trucks need to be coming in every single day. They need to be coming every single day. They need to be coming in from the Israeli crossings. And before we even get to the logistical um, issues of getting aid trucks in, Israel supplies water to Gaza. It has turned off the taps. That's the clean water that people in Gaza need. 
the U.S. government needs to say very clearly to Israel, restore water supply, restore electricity supply, and also to allow fuel in, because the Israeli government has said it will not even allow fuel on the Egyptian border. And that's what the water system needs. That's what hospitals need. Hospitals are running out of fuel for their generators. They're struggling to treat more than 13,000 injured people in addition to regular medical needs. This doesn't have to be as horrible as it is. If the same principle that out, that that guided the United States in its rightful outrage of the of the Hamas uh, targeting of Israeli civilians holds true, the U.S. needs to say that Israel cannot target civilians in Gaza by depriving them of vital supplies. Israel has asked people in the Al Quds Hospital in Gaza to evacuate because there could be an airstrike soon. I spoke to an Israeli Defense Force spokesperson earlier and asked about that. He said they're not specifically targeting the hospital, but that the hospital is likely to be impacted by a strike nearby. In the eyes of humanitarian law, is that allowed? Is that legally uh, something that Israel could do without, uh, I mean, how would you describe it? Under international humanitarian law, hospitals have special protections and warring parties have obligations to protect civilians, as does Israel in particular as the occupying power in Gaza. The problem with the evacuation orders that the Israeli go government is issuing is that there's nowhere to go and there's no safe place to get there. So ordinarily, warring parties are encouraged to give warnings to civilians where those warnings allow civilians to keep themselves safe. But if you tell people to evacuate and there's nowhere to go and no way to evacuate the 400 plus critically ill patients who don't have a safe place to go to, that's not an effective warning. And the people who remain in the hospital retain their protections under international law. And the Israeli government needs to ensure that it does not strip civilians of the protections they have because they cannot or will not, or will not obey an impossible evacuation order. Sorry, Bashir from Human Rights Watch. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, as we just mentioned, we are getting word that trucks are now crossing from the Egyptian side of the Rafah border into Gaza. Now, this border has been closed for days with neither people nor goods passing through. The trucks carrying humanitarian aid supplies have been lining up on the Egyptian side ready to drive into Gaza, where the needs are, of course, immense, as we've been discussing people there, uh, without clean drinking water, food, electricity, fuel, medical supplies. Visitors and foreigners, of course, have also been waiting to get out of Gaza into Egypt and back to their home nations. U.S. President Joe Biden announced earlier this week that Egypt's president said he would allow some aid to get through. The U.S. Embassy in Israel is warning the situation could become chaotic if too many people try to cross the border all at once. We will keep an eye on those pictures as that develops. But for now, after a quick break, we're going to hear from the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, who sat down with CNN. What he fears could become an existential threat to Palestinians. Welcome back. I'm Linda Kincaid. You are watching CNN Newsroom. The first trucks carrying humanitarian aid have now crossed into Gaza from Egypt. A convoy with 20 trucks just entered the Palestinian enclave moments ago. The crossing is now closed. And two out of 201 hostages held by Hamas are now free. The U.S. is welcoming the release of a mother and daughter from Illinois who've been held captive by Hamas in Gaza for two weeks. A family member says they could return home to the U.S. as early as next week. Protesters are out in full force against Israel's recent attacks on Gaza. Take a look at the scene in Sydney, Australia, one of many global cities where we've seen a show of solidarity with the Palestinians. New York and London have also seen big crowds in recent days calling for an end to the violence. As demonstrations pick up around the world, in the Middle East, protests are intensifying over Israel's bombardment of Gaza in the wake of the Hamas terror attack on the country two weeks ago. And the cries of support for the Palestinians caught in the crossfires reaching a fever pitch. CNN's Nada Bashir has more from Amman, Jordan. We want to caution our viewers that some of the video may be disturbing. In 
downtown Amman, worshippers gather for Friday prayers. But it's not just the call to prayer that has drawn these crowds today. But a call to action, love and solidarity with the Palestinian people. This protest is a pledge, they chant, that the people of Jordan will not leave Gaza alone. Thousands of men, women and children, entire families, draped in the traditional Palestinian scarf, a symbol for many of Palestinian resistance. Well, you can hear how loud the crowds are here, but yet another day in Amman, thousands of people have taken to the streets, protesting against Israel, continued aerial bombardment of the Gaza Strip, protesting in solidarity with the Palestinian people. We are doing this for our families who are dying in Gaza because we are unable to do anything. So the least we can do is stand here in solidarity with them, to support them so that they know that we are with oh. them with our hearts and everything. Oh. There is palpable outrage here in Jordan over Israel's ongoing bombardment of the besieged Gaza Strip and deep-seated anger directed towards both Israel and Israel's Western allies. Many here even calling on the Jordanian government to close down the U.S. and Israeli embassies in Amman. For days now, protests have taken place not only across Jordan, but also across the wider region. In Cairo, where the state has long clamped down on mass demonstrations, hundreds gathered in Tahrir Square. earlier at the Rafah border crossing between Egypt and Gaza, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres was forced to cut his visit short after protests erupted there. <laughs> Gaza has faced relentless Israeli airstrikes for almost two weeks now. <laughs> and protests across the Arab world and the wider region are at a boiling point. <laughs> Iraq Tunisia, Yemen and Turkey, and even further afield. And with Gaza on the brink of a humanitarian catastrophe, this protest movement is only growing stronger. Nada Bashir, CNN, in Amman, Jordan. The Palestinian Authority Prime Minister has likened the current situation in Gaza to Nakba. The word Palestinians use in reference to the creation of modern-day Israel, a word that translates to catastrophe or disaster. Mohammed Chetea says Palestinians are now facing an existential threat, and he believes that things could get even worse. He spoke with Becky Anderson from Ramallah in the West Bank. Palestinians in 1948 were pushed out of their homes, were forcefully transferred to the neighboring countries. Now, for Israel to push again for a forceful transfer of more than a million Palestinians from Gaza, out of Gaza, out of Palestine, into Egypt, is something that has been designed to end the question of the Palestinian right to return of the Palestinian refugees, which was a final status issue in the negotiations. So, that is a concern for Egypt, because Egypt is not ready to be part of a conspiracy to end this Palestinian issue that's called the refugees. And also for Jordan, if that is going to happen in Egypt, then who will prevent the Israelis from pushing us here in the West Bank to be forcefully transferred to Jordan? And that is where the issue of transfer is such a concern, because it is a national security issue for Egypt, it's a national security issue for Jordan, but it is an existential issue for us, the Palestinians. What's Israel's plan if it does destroy Hamas? Who will govern um, Gaza? Is there a world in which the PA takes over? We will not go to Gaza on an Israeli tank. A solution for Gaza is not going to take us anywhere. A solution in the West Bank alone is not going to take us anywhere. So what we want is a comprehensive solution that ends occupation. There has been a surge in violence in the West Bank amid this Gaza conflict. Since October the 7th, more than 80 Palestinians have been killed in either settler violence or by Israeli security. How would you describe the situation here today? 
very inflammatory, very dangerous. And uh, as you rightly said, <coughs> what you see in the West Bank is incursions into Al-Aqsa Mosque, home demolitions, settler terrorism. This Israeli government has changed rules of engagement. Ben Rafir has been distributing machine guns to settlers. They have been channeling violence against us. So there is a mood of anger. Palestinians are demonstrating in support with our people in Gaza. Our, the people who are in the streets today are average Palestinians because they know who is killed in Gaza are average Palestinians, kids and children and women. The IDF has been conducting raids um, specifically in the Nur Shams refugee camp. They say they are targeting, targeting Hamas operations. They say this is counter-terror. Um, uh, raids. How extensive are Hamas's operations in this area? I don't say that they are not. But I'm saying that this situation can be all under control by the Palestinian Authority if the Palestinian Authority is allowed to function. And, they ha and we have not been allowed to function. The Israelis, when you have people killed in the refugee camp of Jenin, people react. A funeral generates funeral. And blood generates blood. And very unfortunately that Israel is the main cause for all what has been happening here and there. Prime Minister, we are hearing calls on the street for Mahmoud Abbas, the president, to resign. What do you make of those calls? Look, people are angry. Mahmoud Abbas has been elected by the general public. We but there hasn't been an election in 16 years. Correct. Yes. yes. but. We have been, he issued, President Abbas issued a decree calling for general elections on the 22nd of May 2021. And it was the Israelis who did not allow us at a time when Israel had five elections in four years. Palestinians were not allowed to have their own elections. But to many Palestinians, the Palestinian Authority's central message that liberation can be achieved through diplomacy has failed. Has it failed? Can diplomacy still succeed? Is there, is there still room for a political solution? Because we are witnessing at present a vacuum into which Hamas is taking terror, not diplomacy, as a tool. Good question. If the situation is deteriorating every single day because of the Israeli measures, then people are looking the other way. But if you ask the Palestinian public, do you want peace? They will say yes. If, do you want two states? They will say yes. Do you want end of occupation? They will say yes. Well, a quick reminder about breaking news this hour. The Rafa border crossing opened briefly. It is now closed after allowing the first aid trucks to cross into Gaza. 20 truckloads of aid crossed that border. Well, after a short break, we're going to bring you some other headlines. We're watching this hour. Stay with CNN. Welcome back. I want to cover some other headlines we're following this hour. Former U.S. President Donald Trump was given a $5,000 fine Friday for violating a gag order in his New York fraud trial. Trump's campaign website was found to have a picture of a social media post attacking the judge's clerk. The judge warned Trump that he could go to jail for violating the order. Attorney Kenneth Chesbro admitted that he helped Trump with its 2020 fake elector's plot in Georgia. Chesbro pleaded guilty to a felony count of conspiracy and agreed to testify in future cases. U.S. House Republicans have no clear path forward after Jim Jordan failed to get enough Republican votes to win the House speakership on his third floor vote. Jordan also lost a secret party caucus ballot held behind closed doors. Several Republicans jumped into the race after the party rejected Jordan but it's unclear if any of them can get the 217 votes needed to win. The speaker vacuum was triggered by a block of hardline conservatives. And without a speaker, the House is effectively frozen. It's an increasingly perilous situation amid conflicts abroad and the government funding deadline next month. Minor kind of tag on charges in the indictment. Um, and that was that. I mean, I, I could absolutely tell you that, again, if he's called, he'll, he'll, he'll go testify and answer their questions. But I would disagree. I don't think Mr. Chesborough snitched against anyone. 
I think he simply decided it was time for him to put this behind him and go on with his life. This was a significant win, a huge win, really, for the Fulton County District Attorney's Office because not only did they secure Sidney Powell on Thursday as a state witness against the former president, but now they also have Ken Chesborough, two key witnesses as the Fulton County District Attorney's Office can narrow its case against former president Donald Trump. Meantime, U.S. House Republicans have no clear path forward after Jim Jordan failed to get enough Republican votes to win the House speakership on his third floor vote. Jordan also lost a secret ballot caucus uh, held behind closed doors. Several Republicans jumped into the race after the party rejected Jordan. But it's unclear if any can get the 217 votes needed to win. The speaker vacuum was stricken, if you remember, by a block of hardline conservatives. And without a speaker, well, the House is effectively frozen. It is an increasingly perilous situation amid conflicts and continuing abroad. The government funding deadline is next month. And speaking of conflicts, we can look much more, of course, in the next hour on the wall uh, taking place in Israel. Thanks very much for your company. I'm Isis Suarez in London. The House is essentially frozen. The House is essentially frozen because of no Speaker of the House. No Speaker of the House. The House is essentially frozen. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right.